And joining us now, TVO's own Foreign Affairs Observer, Janice Stein, the director of the Monk Center for International Studies. Welcome back to TVO, Janice. Pleasure to be here, Thanks Steve. for being here tonight. Here's um, how the BBC described what has been going on between Russia and Georgia in a recent submission. The fighting may well be over in South Ossetia, but the war of words between Russia and Georgia shows no sign of dying down. Both sides blame each other for starting the violence, and as the recriminations get louder, the truth about what really happened seems in danger of being drowned out. Let's get to this notion of truth. In your view, what's the truth of who started this? Overall, the Georgians miscalculated and overreacted. It certainly is true, however, Steve, that for the previous three months uh, since uh, the United Nations recognized Kosovo's independence, the Russians had slowly been moving paratroopers into South Ossetia. And there were low-level provocations. The kind of thing that you might see going on in the schoolyard, one gives a push hoping the other will push back. But essentially, everybody knew the rules. All of a sudden, on August the 7th, it exploded. Allegedly, there was firing uh, coming from South Ossetia. And within a matter of a few hours, the president of Georgia decided he couldn't stand it anymore. He'd been told by Condoleezza Rice, don't do this. We won't support you. But he did it anyway. But he did it anyway. Let's talk now about whether or not this is raising questions about whether we've got a Cold War coming back between the United States and now Russia. Here's Robert Kagan in the Washington Post. Historians will come to view August 8, 2008 as a turning point no less significant than November 9, 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell. Russia's attack on sovereign Georgian territory marked the official return of history indeed to an almost 19th century style of great power competition, complete with virulent nationalisms, battles for resources, struggles over spheres of influence and territory, and even the use of military power to obtain geopolitical objectives. Is that how you see it too? Wrong. 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 Okay. Robert Kagan is wrong, and there has been huge hype uh, of this sort that's been going on since this happened. Uh, the only way to think about this, Steve, is were the Russians um, to base some aircraft in Cuba right now. How would Washington react, whether it has a Democratic president or a Republican president? Uh, fundamentally, uh, NATO, the United States, has been pushing up against Russia's borders. Not only Kosovo, which for them, as fellow Serbs, was a huge issue and a huge humiliation, but missile defense in Poland, uh, an invitation even though it was going to be a long time until they came to the party, for Georgia and Ukraine to join NATO. The Russians were really getting angry. And what the president of Georgia did was take a stick, poke it in the eye of the bear, and expect that the bear would not react. I can't think of any major power that would not have done a version of what Russia did. Not quite that way, uh, but they would have done it. And so this language of a new Cold War serves no one's interest. What's the danger in that? There are huge dangers, really. Um, one, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, the United States, Poland, the new Europe, not Donald Rumsfeld's old Europe, but the new Europe. Uh, Which is the old Warsaw Pact countries. The old Warsaw, yeah. the people who actually knew the old Soviet Union quite well and don't <laughs> like them very much, uh, ratchet up the tension, the Russians respond, and you, you, in fact, create the kind of situation that you're trying to avoid. Uh, secondly, if you actually look at what's happened in the intervening months, almost month now, since the invasion, the Russian stock market has gone way down. Uh, investors have, in fact, fled uh, from Russia as a result of all this, the insecurity. That's only because Russia is more and more part of the global economy, more and more part of Europe. If you slam the door on them, which is what this new Cold War language is all about, you're going to create precisely that situation. OK, I hear you don't like where it's going. But I having, do not. I, having said that, let me read you. I'm going to read you a couple of things right now and then get you to react to that. Here, first of all, the president of Russia, 
not Putin, but the actual real president. The good cop. The guy who's actually got the job, not the guy who's actually doing the right. job, if I can put it that way. Right. Russia, like other countries in the world, says Medvedev, has regions where it has privileged interests. These are regions where countries with which we have friendly relations are located. Asked whether this sphere of influence would be the border states around Russia, he answered, it is the border region, but not only. Right. Contrast that with this. Amid rising tensions over Georgia, U.S. officials are increasingly concerned that Russia is moving to rebuild one of the most dangerous features of the old Soviet Union security structure, its alliance with Cuba. Moscow has been signaling that it wants to restore a long relationship with Havana that included not only economic ties, but also military and intelligence cooperation. It is very Cold War retro, said a U.S. government official. The topic could be reminiscent of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that is a chapter that people don't want to revisit. Listening to all of that, how are we not returning to the Cold War? It sure sounds like we are. Well, again, if we, let's start with Medved. Medvedev's statement first, right? Russia, we have a sphere of influence, and it's the unfortunate part was that last phrase, and not only uh, in the areas that border us. Uh, I can't imagine any U.S. president who wouldn't say Latin America, North America, is in fact a U.S. sphere of influence, and we wouldn't say anything. We would not say, in fact, and we in Canada would be the last country to object to that. We would not say that this is a return to Cold War thinking on the part of the United States. And that's the part that we have a great deal of difficulty hearing from the Russians. Um, this alleged renewal of relations with Cuba, uh, there's really no hard evidence for it, Steve. What you are seeing is some form of economic cooperation, more economic cooperation. They really can't afford to go back to the old days anyway, you can know, they? Here's the bottom line. They are spending 2.7% of their budget on defense. Compare that to the United States, which has the largest military, bigger than everybody else in the world combined. The Russians don't even have the assets to do this. What they have done, and they've, they've played their share in ratcheting up this tension too, They've increased their long-range bomber flights, which, and that's, in a sense, to annoy the United States. They've done that. But they have no assets, really, to get involved in this game, nor will they. Intelligence cooperation between the Cubans and the Russians, there is close intelligence cooperation between the Poles and the United States. So we have to see this, in a sense, as more or less normal politics. Uh, with everybody needing to play by the rules and nobody having bad manners. Okay, but uh, renewed Cold War sells papers, right? That's kind That's of a, exactly a, a sexy way doing. to describe That's it. That's what it's But doing. if you don't like that, what do you want to call what's going on now then? What, you really, what is really going on is a cautionary note. Uh, Cautionary notes don't sell papers. No. <laughs> that's the trouble, and that's why this is a hard story to tell. But it's a caution to the United States. Don't push NATO right up against the borders of Russia. That was never a smart strategy. There's only one way you can do that, Steve. If you want Ukraine and Georgia in NATO, open the door all the way and invite Russia in, too. And if you don't want to invite Russia in, then stop short and don't push up against the borders of Russia, which is what NATO has been doing for the last year. Well, let's look at some other options. Here's George Friedman in, uh, from Stratford writing the following. The Russian invasion of Georgia has not changed the balance of power in Eurasia. It simply announced that the balance of power had already shifted. The United States has been absorbed in its wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as potential conflict with Iran and a destabling situation in Pakistan. It has no strategic ground forces in reserve and is in no position to intervene on the Russian periphery. Fair to say then, America is not really able to respond to what it would perceive as Russian aggression today as it might have been in the past? You know what, Steve, let's really take that one apart. Mm -hmm. When did the United States ever respond to Russian aggression on the ground with military Militarily. force? Militarily. It's a hard one. They didn't do it in 56. They didn't do it in 68 when they invaded Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. They never used military force to respond to Russian aggression on the ground. So that argument is really wholly beside the point. What is true, there's big stakes for oil in this part of the world. There's a pipeline at stake here, uh, which uh, a pipeline route which went around Russia through and through Turkey to get to Turkey, and Georgia is strategic territory from that perspective. It's true also the price of oil has gone up, and that's made Russia wealthier, 
more stable, more corrupt, suffering from the usual mm -hmm. oil politics problem. Maybe more emboldened too. More emboldened, but mm -hmm. you have the curse of oil mm -hmm. playing itself out here in Russia as well. But to see this uh, as a return to a great game where what counts are forces on the ground and military assets, it might sell papers. It just doesn't bear much relationship to what's really happening. Okay, but as you think about the threats to U.S. global supremacy at the moment, how it's high not up Russia. on it's not? They're not high no, on the list. Here's no. an interesting. Here's an interesting um, statistic to think about. By 2050, so that's quite a ways out. Russia's population will be smaller than Yemen's. Than Yemen. Right. Hmm. Okay. It's got one of the lowest birth rates. It's got one of the you die younger in Russia, mm -hmm. partly because the healthcare system is so terrible and there's too much alcohol yeah. on the streets. So if, if anybody is thinking out to who the great powers will be, 2030, 2050, Russia doesn't make the cut. Okay, but you could also argue that a dying power yes. can be more dangerous than That's a stable right. one. That's right. And most, most of the really interesting histories have mm -hmm. always argued that when you're on the decline, that's the dangerous moment. Mm -hmm. So if we all know that, then let's not press, be silly. Let's not be silly well, about this. Let me ask you about approach then, because the U.S. and and you talked about New Europe, you know, the former communist states in Eastern Europe, they have advocated a more aggressive stance yeah. against Russia. On the other hand, Western European powers, very I think, careful. led very careful. Led, uh, they, you know, have declined to pursue any sanctions. They've wanted to take a much more conciliatory and negotiation approach. You Which really is the better approach? Oh, there's no question. It's the second. Uh, you know, President Sarkozy went and he, and I, I must say it wasn't one of his finest moments because he allowed language in the agreement which the, the, which the Russians drove a tank through, uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, but fundamentally the approach is right, Steve. The approach of the old Europeans, the Spanish, the Italians, the French, and the Germans, particularly Chancellor Merkel, is to bring the Russians into Europe to engage, to deepen the ties, not to cut them off, because that fundamentally is the most effective constraint there is. One of the things that constrained Putin uh, in the weeks right after was the drop in the stock market price. People, Russians, wealthy Russians lost a fortune, and apparently were not very happy about it. Hmm. That can't happen if you're out of the game. How do we in the West say to countries who for 60 years we have been saying, you know, if only you would get away from the Russian influence, we would be happy to welcome you into our family. How do we suddenly tell the Ukraines and the Poles and these kinds of people, you know, you've done what we asked, but you can't come into NATO after that's, all? That's the hard part. And, and fr frankly, it's not the Poles and the Czechs and the Slovaks, uh, because Russia has accepted that mm -hmm. grudgingly, unwillingly. And all those countries had very, very bitter experiences yes. with the old Soviet Union and very real memories. So their behavior is completely understandable. It's the Georgias, uh, it's the Ukraines, the, you know, the parts that were actually part of the Soviet Union. Um, I think the argument has to be very much about how is all of Europe more secure? over the next 10 years. As well, opposed to your particular country. As opposed to your particular country. They've got to see the big country. picture. They've got to see the big picture. And oh. a lot of what we're reading and a lot of what we're seeing is looking back almost nostalgically at a world where it was military forces and tanks that mattered, but you got no security at all. Hmm. Let me read you one more thing. Here's Fareed Zakaria from Newsweek magazine. Right. The attack on Georgia will go down not as the dawn of a new era of Russian power, but as a major strategic blunder. Look at what has happened, he says. Russia has scared its neighboring states witless, driving them firmly into the arms of the West. Vladimir Putin has done more for transatlantic unity than a President Barack Obama ever could. He's absolutely right, You Curry. like this one. Well, he's absolutely right. Probably the best, I do like that one. <laughs> of all the ones you've read me, that's the one I like the best. Uh, and, and look how correct he is. The United States had been in tortuous negotiations with Poland uh, to establish missile defense uh, on Polish territory. Oh, got nowhere. Literally within days of the Russian invasion of Georgia, the Poles signed up. They did it. And the public supported it. So Russia has created fear um, nervousness, hostility on its own borders uh, among New Europe. That doesn't work to Russia's interests as well. And you know who said so? Mikhail Gorbachev. In a very interesting interview just a day or two ago, he said two things. He said to the West, don't undo everything that's been done 
um, in the last 15 years, and to the Russians, be careful. The costs of this are huge. Hmm. Janice Stein, always good to have you in our studios Pleasure. here in TVO. We'll see you again soon.